molecular plant physiology creates drought-tolerant crops. Jill Farrant, University of Cape Town, South Africa. On the 9th of November, my Polish-German supervisor called me to listen to the news broadcasts about the war. We celebrated with a cup of iced tea, our secret code for a whiskey. Breaking the wall of famine. I don't think it's any coincidence that I'm the last talk before lunch. But it's an ambitious title. And um, I prefer to entitle what I'm going to talk to you today, Finding New Ways to Fight Famine by Growing Crops in Drought-Prone Areas. It's well known that drought causes severe loss to world agriculture. And in fact, the um, FAO in the late 1980s released a report to say that there's more loss due to drought than any other stress combined. This slide shows you um, in red the areas on our planet where there are deserts currently. Now it's predicted that in 60 years time, due to global warming, this is what our planet is going to look like. Now my country, situated on the tip of Africa there, is classified as hyper-arid, arid and semi-arid, with only 11.6% of our land suitable for agriculture. And at some point in the very near future, we're going to have to grow crops in more drought-prone areas where there is no supplemental irrigation and there is, where rain is scarce, just for food security purposes. But to this point, that hasn't been possible. Why? Well, the majority of organisms on Earth are, in fact, homoeohydric. Just a fancy term for saying we have to keep our water levels constant or we will die. The other fact is that the majority of organisms on Earth comprised predominantly of water. You and I are 80% water. There are 44 kilograms of water standing right here, so you can work out my mass if you like. But the fact is that because we are homoeohydric, we can afford to lose very little water. It's estimated that in the microbial and animal kingdoms, we can lose about 1 to 10% of our water before we die, and you and I can lose 1% of our water. Plants can lose a little bit more. They can lose between 10 to 45% of the water, and that really makes sense. They can't get up and move to a water, center, to a water a source. I'm going to introduce a new term now. We're all desiccation sensitive. And plants have evolved really um, efficient ways to either resist or to avoid water loss. And some extreme examples of, of resistance are, for example, succulents, cacti and valvitia, which grow in deserts. They hold on to their water at all costs, well, at great cost, but they grow really slowly. Then there are things like trees and shrubs, which send down deep roots, and they tend to mine subterranean water supplies, flushing it over themselves to keep them wet. It's estimated that a single eucalypt can lose 10 liters of water an hour into the atmosphere. And then there are things like annuals, which are programmed to grow only during the rainy season. And you get spectacular examples of that, too. This is in my country before and after the spring rains, where you get this massive flowering. Now, all the crops on which we are reliant for our food are annuals. And so they have very little by way of natural resistance to water loss. And that's why we get crop failure. Maize crop, two weeks without rain, it's lost 40% of its water, and it's dead. And this is meant to be one of the more tolerant varieties of maize that we have on the market today. I don't believe it's tolerant at all. I think it's probably slightly more resistant to water loss, better root systems and the like. So then what is my solution? to all of this. Resurrection plants. They can lose 95% of their water, remain in the dead or the dry, dead-like state for prolonged periods of time, and revive and continue growing when it rains, making them truly drought or desiccation tolerant. Now you'll have been given, some of you, a little test tube with a resurrection plant twig in it. It's Myrothamnus fibellifolius. Looks like that. Put the end of it in a little bit of water and watch the miracle of resurrection happening in the privacy of your home. And it's safe to do with your kids. It's fun. Do it. Now, desiccation tolerance, the strict definition is up there, is rare in vegetative tissues of plants. About 350 species can do this. But it's relatively common in seeds. We, in fact, call them orthodox seeds. And all of the crops that we use for agriculture produce orthodox seeds annuals can get through living or through those bad environmental periods as a dry desiccation tolerant seed. They only germinate once the growing season comes again, and once they've germinated, you can't dry them down again. 
because they'll die. But resurrection plants, you can. So my research has all been about how do resurrection plants, well, how do they die, dry without dying? And I've used what I call a systems biology approach to understand how they do this. It's quite complex, and I use both a top-down and a bottom-up approach, but I'm going to talk mainly about the bottom-up approach for time purposes. But essentially what we do is we look at changes at the molecular level in the transcriptome, which is just a fancy word for saying we look at the genes switched on during drying, the proteome, proteins switched on during drying, and you get it, the metabolites, and the fats. Once you've got some idea of what that protection might be and how it's regulated at the molecular level, we do things like cell biology and structural biology. What do those proteins look like? Where do they sit in the cell? If we can label uh, a protective, uh, a uh, putative protectant with a fluorescent label, we can see where in the tissue it occurs. If you label it with a gold label and you use an electron microscope, you can see where it precisely in the cell it occurs. All these black dots are gold labeled of a particular protectant that I'm looking at. Then we use biochemical and physiological studies to understand the function of those protectants. And finally, that will help us hopefully understand how the plant copes with its environment. And my philosophy has always been I need to have a comprehensive understanding of the mechanisms of desiccation tolerance before I have a meaning, or can make a meaningful suggestion for a biotech application. So what is my biotech application? Well, quite simply, it's using some of the protection mechanisms that I have found out from resurrection plants to make crops more drought tolerant. And yes, I will be using what commonly is termed genetically modified organisms. I will be making them. It's a term I hate. And in fact, if there's one wall I'd like to break down today, it's the wall of ignorance about plant GMO. And we'll make a short illustration here using maize. I can do this with pretty much any of the cereal crops that we eat today. But the original ancestor of maize is a little plant, a little weed really, called teosinte. That's the cob. 7,500 years later, we have maize due to conventional breeding started by Mexican women, as I said, 7,500 years ago. This Conventional breeding has resulted in millions of gene changes, chromosome doubling, tripling, or more, extensive rearrangements of those chromosomes, transposon activity, another word for jumping genes, causing gene duplication, deletion, reversal. And this is ultimately a highly genetically modified plant from its original ancestor, but it's safe to eat. Biotechnology, on the other hand, allows transfer of a small amount of material into a location that we can accurately determine and the consequences of which are rapidly tested and easily reversed. So here, I'm going to do the biochem, the biotechnology approach. And how? What am I going to do? Well, seeing we're looking at a, a seed cob there, my research has been able to show that resurrection plants turn on a lot of seed genes in their roots and leaves when they dry down. This is a, a bit of data, not too, a bit complex, but let me walk you through it. It's really a study in which we looked at gene expression in wet roots and dry roots and then compared that with gene expression in, sorry, wet roots and wet leaves and compared that with gene expression in dry leaves, roots and seeds of a resurrection plant. And then we compared all of that with a very drought sensitive little plant called Arabidopsis thaliana. And PCA analysis shows that in fact gene expression in dry leaves, dry roots and seeds cluster really closely, meaning that they're quite similar in gene expression. It's very different from the expression in wet leaves and wet roots. Whereas in the sensitive model, the plant, gene expression in wet roots and dry roots, very similar, very little change in gene expression, and the same with leaves. But it clusters really differently from the seeds. And if we look at the expression in these three categories here in resurrection plants, we find that 15% of the genes that we analyze are actually switched on, seed genes, switched on in roots and leaves of resurrection plants. And to show you in a little cartoon format, when these things dry down, they switch on those seed genes. In a maize plant, or any other crop, for example, those genes are permanently switched off. They're only switched on when the plant makes seeds. And what I'm trying to do is to understand the signals that unit resurrection plants use to switch on those seed genes, and then switch them on, or at least to switch select ones on, in crop plants. But that's not going to be enough to make a drought-tolerant crop. We have to consider plant-specific mechanisms and there are many that I could draw to your attention right now, but I'm going to draw to your attention one. Probably one of my, in, in my opinion, one of the most important processes in biological processes in life today, photosynthesis. It's the process by which light energy from the sun is captured by a molecule called chlorophyll in leaves, 
where together with carbon dioxide and water from the environment, that energy is converted into carbohydrates and oxygen, both of which we need. Carbohydrates make the plant grow, and whether you like it or not, we need plants and and, and because we eat plants, and animals eat plants, and we eat animals, and so we absolutely need to have plants. So photosynthesis is a vital uh, metabolism, but it's also a very dangerous metabolism under water deficit stress because of the formation of things called reactive oxygen species. And essentially, these are free radicals. In small amounts, they're okay, but in large amounts, they cause enormous damage. Now, this little cartoon shows you that there are three places in which free radicals form quite naturally during the process of photosynthesis. The excitation of chlorophyll, the splitting of water, and the reduction of ferrodoxin. Now, normally, these are just mopped up by what I call housekeeping antioxidants. But under water stress conditions, chlorophyll will continue to absorb light energy, regardless of whether there's water enough present to make that, take that through to photosynthesis. And that causes enormous free radical or ROS damage. And people working exclusively in this field say this is the major cause of crop loss. And I agree. So what do resurrection plants do to avoid this or to stop this, this damage? Well, firstly, they minimize that light chlorophyll interaction. And then secondly, they remove whatever ROS is formed by antioxidants with unusual characteristics. I'm going to show you a little video now of two resurrection plants drying down, and that will illustrate how they deal with that first strategy. Watch and see if you get what they're doing. So a lot of leaf folding and a lot of color change. Essentially what is happening in the top plant, Craterostigma wormsii, all these inner leaves are completely shaded over by the outer leaves that fold up over them. And the only surfaces that remain exposed to light are the bottom surfaces of that outermost rosette of leaves. And they go really purple. And that's due to the accumulation of things that I call sunblock pigments that mask chlorophyll and reflect back photosynthetically active light. In this plant down below, that's your little one in the bottle, folds its leaves up against the stem, keeping the chlorophyll on the inside. The outside goes very brown. Again, sunblock pigments. If you cut across that leaf, you can see it is green on the inside. And in fact, because of the strategy, the chloroplasts in dry leaves are very well preserved. And the moment these plants get water, they open up their leaves and they photosynthesize and start carbon gain again. But the other species who actually literally get rid of their chlorophyll and they break down their thylakoid membranes because it's a really dangerous process. And these plants can last much longer in the dry state. But there is a downside, as you'll see a little bit later. They take a bit longer to recover. They have to resynthesize chlorophyll and resynthesize those thylakoid membranes. Now, the ROS that are formed, and they do, they form for many other metabolisms, are very effectively quenched in a number of ways. They use seed-specific antioxidants. I'll turn those on in another way. They use novel plant-specific antioxidants. Don't have time for that. But they use housekeeping and antioxidants, and those are antioxidants that every plant has, and you and I have, but they have unusual characteristics. This is the last data slide I'm going to show you. And it's, it shows actually the antioxidant con, um, activity of four different enzymes, ascorbate peroxidase, glutathione re, re, uh, reductase, <coughs> catalase, and superoxide dismutase, in a number of resurrection plants and drought-sensitive species. And what essentially is happening in the drought-sensitive species as you dry them down, there's an increase in activity, but it drops at 50% water content. Those enzymes are dead. They're denatured. In resurrection plants, they can increase and decline, but they re have retained the ability to be active. They're not, because there's too little water, but they have the ability. And it's those enzymes that recover during rehydration. So what do these things do? Well, they make heat-stable, drought-tolerant, um, antioxidants. I'm going to do one final thing now because I'm about to have a rose. I'm going to show you a video of three resurrection plants rehydrating. Okay? Oh, wow. It must resurrect to show it the, show it the water. There's a time axis at the bottom. Watch it. And as you do this, imagine this being your garden at the end of a dry... <laughs> Seriously, guys? At a dry, dry summer. Watch. When the rain comes, this is what happens. Okay, thank you.